welcome everyone to uh, Medicine Grand Rounds for this first um, week in March. Um, as you know, we have a series of presentations, usually in the spring, that are updates from subspecialties. Um, and uh, we always uh, ask folks to uh, present information from their subspecialty that is um, germane and of interest to uh, the general audience. And so I'm really excited today to have our updates in endocrinology um, on a topic that I have definitely scratched my head about uh, many times uh, looking at scans. And so presenting today is Dr. Erica Giraldi. Uh, Dr. Giraldi is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine in endocrine with a dual appointment in neurosurgery. She completed medical school and residency at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland and then completed her endocrinology fellowship in 2020 here at Emory. Dr. Giraldi's primary clinical focus is the diagnosis and management of pituitary diseases, as well as general endocrinology and metabolism. She works within the Pituitary Center at Emory with her clinical research focus on acromegaly and Cushing's disease. And she is gonna to talk to us about the pituitary incidentaloma, a diagnosis on the rise. And so thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Giraldi, and I'm excited to hear your talk. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Um, so let me share my screen. Um, okay. Uh, can everybody see the screen? No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to tell you that we can. Oh, that, there you go. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Um, give me one second here. All right. So yeah, so today we'll be talking about um, pituitary stentiloma diagnosis on the rise. I thought this was a relevant talk because I think it happens very often that, you know, you have um, brain imaging for other reasons, whether it's someone who's had a motor, motor vehicle accident or, you know, some other reason, and you find these pituitary um, lesions. And it is very pertinent to know what to do as a um, primary care doctor or as a hospitalist or as a general internist and sort of how to, um, how to address these. Um, so without further ado, let's see if this works here. Okay, so I have no um, disclosures. I have four main objectives for today. By the end of this talk, I hope you will be able to define a pituitary incidentaloma um, recognize the increasing incidence of pituitary tumors, describe the initial workup for a pituitary incidentaloma, and lastly, identify patients who may need further testing and or therapy. So first of all, um, I'd like to say that a, what's the definition of a pituitary incidentaloma? So it's a pituitary lesion that's found incidentally. Um, and this means like it was done for reasons unrelated to the lesion itself or its consequences. Um, so this is a patient with an emergency room after motor vehicle accident, they scan his head, they find a cellar lesion. Or I had a patient recently in my clinic who um, had a PET scan done because they were concerned for, I think, lymphoma, and again, found a large pituitary um, lesion. So, But these are not patients who are screened because you think they have acromegaly or Cushing's or because they have vision changes or headaches. So they are, the main differentials there are are so the top three um, are pituitary adenomas, Rathke's cleft cysts, and craniopharyngiomas. And the majority really of these lesions are pituitary adenomas, about 80 to 90% of them. As a brief reminder, um, Rathke's cysts, they come from a lack of complete regression and closure of the Rathke's pouch, which is a de developmental precursor to the pituitary gland. And craniopharyngiomas are rare malformational tumors of low histologic malignancy, and these arise along the craniopharyngeal duct. Um, but for today's purposes, we will be focusing on pituitary adenomas. So why does this matter? Why do we care? Um, well, there has been an increased prevalence of these adenomas over time, and also an increased number of incidentally detected um, pituitary adenomas. And this does seem to be a global trend overall. So to frame this discussion, I would like to briefly talk about the history of MRI and how this has developed over the past 40 years. So Paul Lauterbur um, first showed that nuclear MRI could be used to create an image in the 1970s. Um, it wasn't until the mid 1980s that the 1.5 Tesla MRI emerged, but really it was only used, um, only commercially implemented at least the three Tesla machine was um, in the late 1990s. And it was only in 2017 that the FDA approved the first seven Tesla machine for clinical use. So over the past 40 years, we've had a dramatic and rapid development in technology. 
So it's perhaps unsurprising that this development seemed to be paralleled by the increased use of MRI in clinical research. So this study actually looked at the number of publications per year that included nuclear magnetic resonance or magnetic resonance imaging in the title. And as you can see, it skyrockets um, around the 1990s, which is, as you may remember, when you have that increased use in the uh, three Tesla machines. So by 2010, there were tens of thousands of MRI imagers used to perform approximately 30 million MRI examinations worldwide. So again, we've seen this rapid, I'm sorry? Oh, so we've seen this rapid increase in, in, in use. So overall, the increase in MRI use um, seems to parallel an increase in this detection of pituitary tumors. Um, that said, of course, correlation is not necessarily causation. So this is a very recent study. It was just published uh, about a month ago. And it's the only study to my knowledge that has actually looked at the epidemiology of pituitary adenomas within the United States specifically. The data is from SEER. Um, and SEER basically provides clinical databases that report cancer incidence and survival from regional registries across the US. And is required to report all cancer diagnosis in its area. Um, now, I would like to highlight one thing. So this study very interestingly made, uh, you know, differentiated between pituitary adenomas and incidentally detected pituitary adenomas, but the authors made a big assumption. So they assumed that um, pituitary incidentaloma, so incidentally detected tumors, were non-prolactinomas that were not operated on surgically. And their reasoning for this was that if the tumor was heavily symptom driven from the tumor itself, meaning headaches or vision field changes, then they would have undergone surgery right away. Now, this is probably true for non-functional adenomas, but this is certainly not true uh, for functional tumors. So it's not true for your Cushing's patients or your acromegaly patients. Because in those patients, even if the tumor is small, the primary treatment is surgical. So you don't have to have those headaches or, the, or those visual field deficits to undergo surgery. That said, the majority of pituitary tumors is non-functional. So I still think that this data is valuable. Um, as you can see here in 2004, 25% of the pituitary tumors at diagnosis were incidentally detected. And this number increased to 42% by 2018. And this is this dark um, bar at the top. But as you can see, there was also an increase in the pituitary adenomas overall. Now, if we're looking at the, um, uh, at the incidence, um, this was also increasing. This is data that's expressed per 100,000. Um, so the pituitary incidentaloma had a standard incidence rate of 0.73 in 2004, and this went up to two by 2018. And there was an increase, but not as dramatic in overall pituitary adenomas from three to 4.67 over the past 14 years. Now, this trend does seem to be global. Um, so there, this was a study done in Iceland. Uh, it was a retrospective observational study conducted over about 70 years, and it included all of the pituitary adenomas diagnosed during this time frame. Um, overall, 470 patients were identified. And again, SIR is the standard incidence rate, increased from 0.6 in the 1950s to 60s to 5.8 between 2003 and 2012. And of course, the prevalence increased correspondingly during this time. Now, they actually looked at, um, they sort of split up the types of tumors too. Um, and as you can see here, overall, the, the cases increased. And really the other two major cases that saw dramatic increases over time were diagnosis of non-functional pituitary adenomas, that's NFPA, um, and of prolactinomas. So you have the prolactinomas in this lighter green line and this more vibrant line is the non-functional tumors. There was a slight increase in acromegaly and Cushing's too over this time, but really not quite as dramatic. And again, I would like to highlight that when have these tumors really taken off in terms of diet, in terms of detection? Again, that those 90, in the 1990s. So when um, the 1.5 and 3 Tesla machines really uh, started being used uh, more commonly. <clears throat> 
Now, these changes also um, uh, were seen in Sweden. Um, this study was interesting. It doesn't show quite as dramatic an increase. Um, this was data from the Swedish Pituitary Registry and looked from 2001 to 2011, included about 600 patients. And they um, actually differentiated between men and women. Um, this dark line here is the men and this dotted line here is the women. And there was overall an increase by about 4.3% in annual incidence in men. And there was actually a decrease in women. Um, the authors don't really explain why there was this gender difference. Now, I would like to highlight that one of the possible reasons we don't see as dramatic an increase in this study is a time period. So it was from 2001 to 2011, so a lot more recent, whereas the other studies that we looked at looked at um, sort of broader time ranges. So overall, um, I would like to highlight three main points. Number one, there has been an increase in pituitary adenoma detection. This increase does seem to parallel an increase in imaging, um, but that said, correlation is not causation, so there certainly may be other factors at play. So let's start with a clinical case. So this is a fairly classic case. So it's um, uh, patient C67, he's male, he presents with stroke-like symptoms to the emergency department. Um, CT scan is done, and it shows a hypoenhancing area on the pituitary that's poorly defined. Um, so his stroke was not actually a stroke, we'll call it a TIA, um, but he sees his PCP in follow-up, who orders an MRI, and this shows a 1.1 centimeter adenoma. And as you can see here, we have the sagittal view on the left, the coronal on the right. Um, this is the pituitary gland right here. You can see that area of hypoenhancement over here on the coronal. You can see it here on the um, sagittal. Um, this is the pituitary infundibulum. This is the chiasm. These are both carotids. And so you sort of see this area of hypoenhancement. So what are your next steps? Um, so the way I typically um, explain this to patients also in clinic is when someone is diagnosed with a pituitary tumor, there are two main questions you need to ask. Number one, is this tumor hypersecretory? So is this a prolactin secreting tumor? Is there hypoprolactinemia? Is this Cushing's disease? Is this acromegaly? Or is this a TSHOMA? Um, for today's purposes, I will not be discussing TSHOMAs. They are incredibly rare. I think we've had a handful total in our center in like 20 years. So, um, And then the second question is, is there hyposecretion? So um, is there central hypothyroidism, central adrenal insufficiency, secondary hypogonadism, or growth hormone deficiency? And I think of these in two separate categories, and I evaluate for each one. So let's talk about hypersecretion first. Um, so the prevalence in incidentally um, found tumors is about 0.04 to 1 in 1,000. So certainly it does need to be evaluated. Um, now, a prolactin level, um, according to the JCM guidelines, or endocrine society guidelines, is considered essential. So you would want to do this in all patients. Why is this essential? Well, if this is determined to be a prolactin secreting tumor, meaning a prolactinoma, then primary treatment is dopamine agonist therapy um, and is medical uh, and is not surgical. So this is very important to identify. Um, now, acromegaly, um, certainly the IGF-1 level to screen for acromegaly is a recommended test. Um, this one, there was a little bit more debate on, and I think one of the reasons it's a little more expensive than a prolactin level, um, the reasoning why overall it is still recommended is if you miss a diagnosis of acromegaly, there is a very high risk of morbidity and mortality um, down the line. And in fact, there is a lead time to diagnosis of about five to 10 years in these patients. Um, so you would overall, the IGF-1 level is recommended. So what about Cushing's? So this is recommended only if clinically indicated, and I'll talk about this a little bit more and why, um, but this one we only do if there is an appropriate clinical scenario. Okay, so let's talk about hyperprolactinemia first. So um, in terms of symptoms, um, it essentially presents with um, symptoms consistent with hypogonadism. Um, and so this means amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea in women, um, breast tenderness. Um, of course, they can present with galactorrhea. And really the long-term concern is bone density loss. 
In men, similarly, symptoms of hypogonadism, so decreased libido, erectile dysfunction, and they can also present with gynecomastia. And similarly, if they are hypogonadal because of the hyperlactin, then again, there's concern for bone density loss. So just as a um, brief reminder, so the reason why the hyperlactin affects the gonadal axis is it decreases the levels of kisspeptin. Uh, the decreased levels of kisspeptin um, decrease the GnRH release, and therefore you get a loss of the GnRH surge, hence decreased LH and FSH, and therefore decreased estradiol and testosterone. Now, prolactin is a tricky one. So hyperprolactinemia that's unrelated to prolactin-secreting tumor is usually, is usually less than 150. And you can have prolactin elevations that are from causes other than a pituitary tumor. So you could have a pituitary tumor and have a prolactin elevation, and those two are not correlated. So what are some causes of prolactin elevation? So we have physiologic causes. So this would be um, if someone had undergone intercourse the night before their lab testing, if they um, had vigorously exercised, of course, if they're pregnant, if they have a disordered um, sleep pattern, if they're particularly stressed, all of these can cause elevations in prolactin. But typically, these elevations are mild. So definitely less than 150. I normally see numbers like 30s, 40s, 50s to give you a ballpark. Now, systemic causes can also increase prolactin. So chronic renal failure can present with this cirrhosis, of course, cranial radiation, seizures. PCOS actually can present sometimes with slightly elevated prolactin levels, again, 30s, 40s normally. Um, severe hypothyroidism can, and of course, if there's any trauma to the chest wall or herpes zoster, that can. Now, the other big, big cause of hyperprolactinemia is um, medications. And so um, I would say the three classes I always pay the most attention to are antipsychotics. These can actually lead to very high levels, even in the high hundreds. Um, antidepressants can cause some prolactin elevations. We're talking sertraline, fluoxetine, et cetera. And opiates can also cause this. So um, I always look at a medication list um, when I'm interpreting the prolactin to make sure there are no confounding factors. So what about non, um, so what non-physiologic or non, um, uh, non other cause of prolactin? Well, you can have stock effect. So this is when the tumor compresses the pituitary stock and basically uninhibits um, the prolactin release um, through mediation of dopamine. And so um, you're getting these prolactin levels that are typically less than 150, but again, can be slightly elevated and it's not coming from the um, tumor itself. So it's not a prolactinoma. It's just um, from the prolactin essentially, from the tumor compressing the stock. Now, macroprolactinomas typically have levels above 200. Um, I've frequently seen patients with levels in the four or 500, even thousands. Um, and microprolactinomas are tricky because this can be really variable. So with the micros, you can have levels that are like 80 to 200. So that overlap with the previous causes of hyperprolactinemia that I was discussing. And that's where it gets a little more challenging to tease out. One more note, sometimes a tumor can have a cystic component if it's a prolactin secreting tumor or bleed into itself. And in those cases, again, you can't count on the prolactin level as you normally would, but that's sort of getting into the, some of the new ones of it. So what about the hook effect? Um, so this is really a concern with um, macro prolactinomas. And this is when your prolactin level, your true prolactin level is much higher than what the lab reports. Um, and basically the reasoning for this, is so you add the sample that contains the high um, uh, hormone concentration to the test tube. And then the studied hormones, so we have like little green balls here, um, overwhelm and saturate both the capture and the single antibodies, um, signal antibodies. And so it prevents the formation of sandwiches. And so after the washout phase, there's only a few sandwiches left producing a low signal. And so what you need to do is need to dilute the samples so that you allow for more of the sandwiches essentially to form. And so this, is, again, can happen with your macroprolactinoma. So you'll see a level, an undiluted level of about, let's say, like 300. Then when you dilute the sample, the level can go up to like five or 600. It can become relevant because, again, if you're treating these patients medically, you really want to know what number you're starting at. 
Um, but Emory Lab will um, dilute the sample. You can actually order the sample initially as um, diluted. So let's move on to Cushing's disease. So Cushing's disease is always a very challenging diagnosis. Um, the features that best discriminate it at initial presentation are um, easy bruising, facial plethora, striae, and proximal myopathy. Um, some of the other symptoms are highly prevalent in the general population. And so while they do present with Cushing's, they don't discriminate it well. And so that's the, you know, the obesity, the uncontrolled diabetes, the hypertension, and so on. And so it is helpful to keep in mind that if patients have these um, uh, physical features, then you do want to pay a little bit more attention to it. In the exam, I actually test their proximal muscle strength. Um, to see about the myopathy. And you can ask patients, like, can you get up from a chair without using your hands? Can, are you able to wash your hair? Or do you have trouble just like lifting your arms? And, and the true Cushing's patients typically can't, well, depending on how severe the Cushing's is, but they can present with this. So what's the testing for Cushing? So we have three main tests that we use for the initial screening. We have the one milligram dexamethasone suppression test, the 24 hour urine free cortisol, and the late night salivary. And I'll go into the um, caveats of each of this testing a little bit. But what I would like to highlight here is the sensitivity is incredibly high of these tests, and the specificity is a little bit more variable. Um, so there is a high risk of false positive testing. So let's talk about the UFC first. So the principle of this is that you have increased cortisol production and therefore this leads to increased urinary cortisol excretion. You can get false positives. So the false positives occur if patients over collect the urine. Typically this is over five liters um, a day, but really you can calculate it by, you know, if someone's supposed to urinate 50 mils per gig per day, um, you can sort of do a body weight calculation. If they're pregnant, of course, you can get a false positive. If they have a history of alcoholism, if they strenuously exercised. Um, so it, it's a little bit, um, again, it's an excellent test, but, but can um, fool you. Conversely, you can get false negative testing in patients with renal impairment. And technically, um, per our society guidelines, this means GFR less than 60. So not even that significant impairment. And mild Cushing's disease um, will not always present with a high UFC. Now, the late night salivary cortisol is very sensitive. And the, the principle of this, that's based on disruption, the diurnal variation of cortisol. So your cortisol level is supposed to be highest around eight o'clock in the morning, and then really be at the lowest around bedtime. And so we have these patients collect this salivary sample right when they feel sleepy around 10, 11 p.m. at night. Um, and it's supposed to be low, and if it's above a certain threshold, um, then we're concerned for Cushing's. Now, you can get false positives with this, a lot of false positives, actually. And so um, these can happen with night shift workers, because again, their circadian rhythm is flipped, so therefore the testing's not as accurate. In smokers, I had a patient who um, was taking some medicated lip balm that had hydrocortisone in it, and her salivary testing was like through the roof. And it was only when I pried that I found out she was taking this lip balm. Um, licorice can affect it. Um, and I would say the most common thing I see is blood contamination. So if patients are brushing their teeth right before doing the test or they have gingivitis, you can get a few drops of blood. This can really skew your testing. It's no longer interpretable. Um, now, luckily the lab Emory actually reports that there's blood contamination if you look under the, um, the comment section. And so that's always very helpful. This is not validated in end-stage renal patients. So what about the one milligram dex suppression test? This is when you give one milligram of dexamethasone at 11 p.m. And then you measure the cortisol at eight o'clock in the morning, the next, the next morning. So this is based on the principle that um, in Cushing's, you lo lose the feedback inhibition of the HPA axis. Um, and the, the level is, um, it's the cortisol level of 1.8. So if, um, if you suppress below that, Cushing's disease typically rolled out. If you were above that, that's when you're concerned about Cushing's. There can be a lot of false positives with this too. Um, so oral contraceptive pills um, can, um, raise, can raise your cortisol levels, and so you may not suppress fully. I mentioned this specifically because a lot of the patients we who present with Cushing's or who you are concerned for Cushing's tend to be younger women, and so a lot of them on, are on OCP. So you have to stop this um, for some time before testing. Morbid obesity, paradoxically, 
um, can actually lead to false positives. And part of that is that the dexamethasone may not suppress um, their cortisol fully. And then medications. Um, so the medications are uh, basically in patients who have um, changes in the way their dexamethasone is metabolized. Um, you know, if they are rapid metabolizers, then you will, then you can get like a false positive. If they um, have an impaired um, dexamethasone metabolism, so you have higher dexamethasone levels, then you may suppress your cortisol more than you should. So you can get false negatives. And so this is with HIV medications, SSRIs and the likes. So again, when you do this testing, really important that you look at the medication list. Um, lastly, I'm going to briefly test, uh, touch base on um, reactive hypercortisolism. So this was what was known, known formerly as pseudo Cushing. So these are the most challenging patients. These are patients that if you test, um, they, their testing will be positive, but it's from physiologic elevation of the um, of the cortisol. And so this can be patients who have depression, patients have uncontrolled diabetes, again, chicken and egg, hard to tease out sometimes, um, and patients who are hospitalized or physical stress or in a lot of pain. So this is why we never really do this testing um, when patients are actively hospitalized, because you will get these false positives. And so basically, the reason I'm highlighting all of this and this complexity is that um, you know, the, the testing for Cushing's, uh, again, has very high sensitivity, but you can have a lot of false positives. And so it's very important to only test it if the clinical context um, is suggestive of Cushing's. Otherwise, you will get yourself in these situations where you have patients who have um, some slightly high levels and you don't really know what to make of it. And of course, testing begets more testing and, and so on. So moving on to acromegaly. So this is the third. So we talked about the prolactin, we talked about Cushing's, now we're gonna talk about acromegaly. So classically, one thinks of, um, I think in medical school I was taught, you know, when you see a patient who's acromegaly once, you're never gonna forget them. And I think that's somewhat true, but only if um, the patients are fairly advanced in their disease. So the physical changes are actually fairly subtle over time. And in fact, from time of initial diagnosis, uh, from time of initial symptoms to time of diagnosis, there has been a, a about lead time, like five to 10 years, according to most studies. So it is a progressive disease and is not necessarily recognized based on just physical features alone. And again, this is why the IGF-1 is still recommended, even if the patient does not appear to be grossly acromegalic. So it is a multi-organ disease. So in terms of physical changes, the most common changes are the soft tissue hypertrophy, the acral overgrowth. Um, patients will present with headache, uh, will have hypertension. In fact, hypertension presents in anywhere from 20 to 50% of patients. Arthropathy is very common, anywhere from 30 to 70%. Um, and of course, diabetes is also common in almost 50% of patients. So some of the main questions I ask these patients are, have you had increased sweating? Are you having joint pains, um, diabetes, hypertension, changes in ring size, changes in suit, shoe size? Those are some of the key questions. But as you can see, it really affects all organs. It can present with sleep apnea, et cetera. And the morbidity is really high. So how do you screen for acromegaly? You get an IGF-1 level. Um, there are some caveats with testing, but it's not as um, remarkable as it is um, for the Cushing's testing. So overall, I would say this is um, you know, less likely to be affected. But you know, if patients have hepatic failure, renal failure, hypothyroidism, severe infection, then this can affect the testing in this case too. So if you wanted to confirm um, uh, acromegaly, then we do a two hour OGTT. So we give 75 grams of glucose. We check a growth hormone level every 30 minutes. And if it does not suppress below 0.4, then this confirms acromegaly. Um, realistically speaking, um, if the IGF-1 level is significantly elevated and the patient um, has symptoms that are suggestive of acromegaly, you don't always need to do this confirmatory um, testing. But this is just something to um, keep in mind. So how common is incidental detection of these tumors? So there were three studies that were used um, to justify the Endocrine Society recommendation 
for the IGF-1 measurement. Um, and overall, uh, the studies had, I mean, except for the Berman study, the studies had pretty small sample sizes. And so anywhere from like 0.02% to 15% of patients were diagnosed incidentally. So the numbers are really all over the map. Um, and part of the issue is, again, these are really small sample sizes. So we actually tried to look um, at incidental detection of acromegaly in our MRI database. And we looked over the past 20 years and we identified 112 patients who had acromegaly. And of these, 17% were incidentally detected. About 26%, so a quarter of them, were detected because they present with vision changes or headache. And 43%, so almost half of the patients, were diagnosed because of classic physical changes, meaning classic features on exam. So we actually compared the acromegaly patients who were incidentally detected to the patients who presented with classic physical changes. And again, it's interesting because the IGF-1 levels and growth hormone levels were a little lower in the incidentally detected group. Um, I didn't put the upper limit of normal here because it, it, it varies depending on age and sex. But overall, upper limit of normal tends to be about 300 and something for IGF-1 levels, so at least twice upper here. Um, and as you can see, higher than that in the classic phenotypic group. But what I think was interesting that we found, again, in our database, is that patients who were detected incidentally on second review from an endocrinologist, actually 60, oh, close to 60% of them did have those classic physical changes. And so again, these are, this is a cohort that's being missed. Um, and it's because, again, these changes are progressive. These physical changes are progressive over time. And this is why I think checking the IGF-1 level, even though it's not considered essential per the guidelines and is recommended, really should be done. It is to cache like this cohort. So overall, which labs would you order if you had a patient who presented with an um, incidentally detected tumor. So you would order the prolactin level, again, with all those caveats of interpretation, um, to screen for a prolactinoma. Again, those, tr those um, patients would be treated medically, not surgically, um, if it was a prolactinoma. You would get an IGF-1 level to screen for acromegaly. And really, if you were concerned for Cushing's, I would probably defer that to your neighborhood endocrinologist, um, again, to sort of avoid those situations where you have a slight positive testing, and then you get yourself in a bit of a bind. But the prolactin level and the IGF-1 certainly um, should be ordered. So back to our clinical case. So as you remember, he presented with stroke-like symptoms in the emergency room. He was found to have a 1.1 centimeter pituitary adenoma. And then when you ask him about symptoms, so you're trying to think, you know, is this acromegaly? So you ask him about like arthralgias. So he says he did have some right knee pain for several years, but had also been in a skiing accident. Um, you know, you start thinking it's Cushing's, you know, so he gained 10 pounds over the past three years, but he attributes it to COVID. His wife does report he snores at night. Um, so he might have undiagnosed sleep apnea, no increased sweating, no change in shoe or ring size. Um, his past mental history is, is notable for prediabetes, um, some dyslipidemia and hypertension. His medications are not particularly exciting. He's on metformin, hydrochlorothiazide, some ibuprofen and atorvastatin. Um, so on exam, his oops. On exam, his blood pressure is reasonably controlled, and his exam is fairly unremarkable. So no frontal bossing, bossing, um, no prognathism. Um, his hand looked normal. He has no um, supraclavicular fullness, no dorsal cervical fullness. Um, so again, a fairly unremarkable exam. So what testing would you do in this patient? Um, so I actually have a poll everywhere, but I'll read this first. So are you gonna do a prolactin level and an IGF-1? Are you just gonna check a prolactin level in him? Are you gonna do a prolactin level IGF-1, perhaps a 24 hour UFC? Or are you gonna do prolactin level IGF-1 salivary cortisol or a one milligram dex suppression? And I'm going to pull the poll everywhere. Bear with me one second here. Okay, so if you can see the screen here. All right, you should be able to join. Um, and I'll give you a few minutes. Let me know if this is working. 
All right. Give it a couple more seconds. Okay. That's still varying a little bit. Okay. So yes, you guys are correct. So overall, you would check a prolactin level and an IGF-1. There we go. Oops. A prolactin level and IGF-1. So I know some of you um, chose to uh, chose D, uh, which was a salivary cortisol one milligram dex, and that was probably because of the, um, you know, he had gained some weight. He did have a history of pre-diabetes, um, but overall, his symptoms didn't really point towards Cushing. So that's why I would. Uh, probably just do the prolactin IGF-1 level. He didn't have any clear symptoms that would suggest acromegaly, but again, because those patients are frequently missed, you'd want to do the IGF-1 in addition to the prolactin. Wonderful. Okay, so moving on, so you check his levels. So what are they? Well, his prolactin level is 45 and normal is 3 to 13, so it's a little bit high. His IGF-1 level is within the normal range. So there's no biochemical evidence of acromegaly, and this is not a prolactinoma with a 1.1 centimeter adenoma. Your prolactin level would have to be, I mean, honestly, above 100, most likely, most likely above 150. So where, where is this prolactin level of 45 coming from? Possibly from stock effect. So again, from the compression of the pituitary stock. So what about hyposecretion? So hyposecretion um, affects at least one axis um, in about 60-80% of patients who have macroadenomas. Um, with microadenomas, the data overall is scarce. So we're going to talk about it one by one. So central hypothyroidism. So how do you diagnose this? So you have an inappropriately normal or a low TSH. You have a low free T4 level. So we measure, we use the free T4 here. We don't use the total T4 just as a... Um, point. How do these patients present? Well, with the symptoms of hypothyroidism, but I would like to highlight that with secondary hypothyroidism, a lot of the patients are asymptomatic, particularly if they're younger and their levels are slightly low. So I normally go by labs. I do not necessarily go by clinical manifestations. How do you treat them? Obviously levothyroxine, but how much? So one, full replacement dose would be 1.6 mics per kg per day, but this is really the equivalent of a total thyroidectomy dose. And normally there is some TSH function still there. So I actually normally um, start with lower doses. I start with like 50 micrograms or 75 micrograms, and then I up titrate from there. You do have to titrate based on free T4 levels and not TSH. So this is really important. You can't count on the TSH because again, um, it's, it's secondary, not primary hypothyroidism. I would like to highlight, it is important to have normal free T4 levels, ideally before surgery. Otherwise you can have anesthesia complications. So if you have a patient that's slightly low free T4, replace that before, uh, before they go to surgery. Now, one clinical pearl here, you always want to replace the cortisol before replacing thyroid hormones if the patients have concomitant adrenal insufficiency. Um, this is really, really important. And the reason is if you replace the thyroid hormone first and they have adrenal insufficiency, you are increasing their metabolic rate and you can precipitate an adrenal crisis. So really important. And you do cortisol first, then thyroid. So let's talk about secondary adrenal insufficiency. So um, you obviously check um, baseline cortisol at eight o'clock in the morning. And, I and then if, if appropriate, then you do a stimulation test. So if the cortisol level is less than three, there's no need for a stimulation test. They have adrenal insufficiency. Um, now, if it's above that and what an indeterminate level is like debated. So typically if a patient's going to surgery, I use a cortisol threshold of 12 to do a stimulation test. But again, different physicians have different, um, uh, you know, different thresholds for that. Um, so if you're indeterminate, then you would do a stimulation test. There is a new threshold um, for the stimulation test. So the, num the magic number is no longer 18. It's anywhere from 14 to 15. Um, this is based on a study, you can look it up if you're interested, by Javorski in 2021. And uh, basically, they looked at the newer amino assays that are a lot more sensitive than the older ones. And based on these, a level from 14 to 15 was considered appropriate to pass. 
And so I have started implementing this in my clinical practice, uh, but I do interpret this, you know, in the clinical context. So if my index of suspicion is still high and they stem to like 14, sometimes they'll still give replacement hydrocortisone. Uh, but that said, this threshold has changed. Now there is one caveat. Um, so sometimes these tumors can bleed, so they will present with apoplexy to the hospital. And in this case, um, you actually cannot do a stimulation test. It will falsely reassure you. And so you have to rely on the ADM Corzon DCTH. And the reason is that the, you know, when you do a stimulation test, you're given ACTH injection. So you're bypassing the pituitary. And so if um, the adrenal glands have not had time to atrophy, essentially, um, they will still respond they will still respond. And so you'll be falsely reassured. So again, you don't do it within six weeks of a apoplectic bleed. And again, for, same re for the same reason, you don't do it within six weeks of a pituitary surgery. So what are the symptoms? We all know the symptoms of adrenal insufficiency, uh, but again, you can be fooled, especially if patients are young, sometimes they will not present particularly symptomatically. How do you treat them? You give hydrocortisone back. Um, and typically, it's a. I use hydrocortisone. Um, there, there are some centers that use prednisone. I like hydrocortisone because it's a little bit more physiologic, um, and because you can easily test the axis on it. Um, but you take their body surface area, multiply it by that ten. That gives you the total daily dose. Dose two thirds in the morning, one third in the afternoon. So most patients have a body surface area of around two. So total daily dose is twenty. So you get fifteen milligrams in the morning, five milligrams around four o'clock in the afternoon. Of course, you have to warn them about double dosing in case of acute illness. And if they go for surgery, you have to give them stress dosing. What about secondary hypogonadism? So um, again, so a similar trend here, right? Like low estradiol testosterone, inappropriately normal or low FSH and LH. There are testing caveats and this happens all the time. The patient's hospitalized, you get a testosterone level. It's like 2 p.m. that they're admitted. They get the level at two and it's low. And so he's hypogonadal, not necessarily. So for the testing to be reliable, you really need to check it at eight o'clock in the morning fasting. Theoretically, you need two measurements to confirm hypogonadism. Um, you need to exclude hyperlactin, obviously, or that could be causing hypogonadism and exclude severe hypothyroidism. As you know, symptoms, um, I can sort of skip over this a little bit. And then treatment, um, it, you know, if a woman has a uterus, you would want to get the progesterone component in addition to the estrogen. You can do this in like patches and pills, or you can do oral contraceptive pills. And for men, there's like various formulations of testosterone. So lastly, we're going to touch base on growth hormone deficiency. So this one's interesting because you almost don't need to do the testing depending on how many axes are down. So if patients have three to four other uh, pituitary deficits, you're over 95% likely to have growth hormone deficiency. So in adults, if you have an IGF-1 level less than 75 and three deficiencies, you don't need to do further fancy testing for growth hormone deficiency. And this was a study that, again, looked at the number of pituitary deficits and growth hormone deficiency. As you can see, it's well over 95% if you have three or more. Um, there, these are the various tests that you do to diagnose growth hormone deficiency. I'd like to highlight the Massimorellin test. This is the only FDA approved one and was recently approved by the FDA about a year ago. Um, and the way you do it is you give the oral solution at time zero, you measure the growth hormone at various time intervals. And if it's, whoops, if it's less than 2.8, then growth hormone deficiency is confirmed. Um, notably, it can prolong the uh, QT interval, but this is fairly rare. Okay, and so how do patients present? So very non-specifically, I'd say this is a bit challenging. They present with decreased lean body mass, fatigue, decreased quality of life. There's actually a questionnaire you can give um, that helps quantify this. Um, and there are potential treatment benefits to growth hormone replacement. Some of these are benefits of skeletal integrity, body composition, metabolic parameters, but overall treatment is very controversial. So we don't always replace these patients if they're adults. Um, you know, it, it does involve growth hormone injections. Um, it, so it's fairly, um, you know, challenging for the patient. They have to give like daily injections. I think there, there was a formulation that was just to prove this once a week, but, um, and I would say the bigger concern is that, um, there is a theoretical increased risk of malignancy for these patients. So you, if you do replace, you certainly need to screen like age appropriate, um, malignancy screening. So back to our patient. 
So we check our axes for, um, you know, for hyposecretion. So we check a free T4 level and it's a little low, it's 0.45. We check a TSH and it's um, 1.3. So um, in the normal range, we have an 8 a.m. cortisol that is seven. Um, the ACTH is within the normal range and the IGF-1 level is normal. So what are your next steps? So do you replace the hydrocortisone? Um, do you start the levothyroxine? Um, you start hydrocortisone um, 15 in the morning, five in the afternoon, and, or do you perform a stimulation test? And again, I'm gonna, whoops, there we go. Thank you. We'll do a little poll everywhere. Okay. Seems that people are split between starting levothyroxine or doing a stem test. Okay. So we will stop it here. So the correct answer is actually you would do a stimulation test. And the reason is, let me go back to the labs again. So, you know, clearly this is consistent with secondary hypothyroidism, but their cortisol level is indeterminate. And so you would want to make sure, definitely sure that they are not adrenally insufficient before replacing that, um, that thyroid. And that's particularly if they're going to go to surgery. So you do the stem test first. Um, and then uh, once you have the results of that, then you would replace the levothyroxine. So overall, um, so what labs would you order for hyposecretion? You get the 8 a.m. cortisol level and stimulation test as needed, free T4 and TSH. And then again, the growth hormone IGF-1, testosterone, FSH, LH, you would consider getting those, but really the ones that um, are important in terms of acute management are the adrenals and the thyroid. These honestly can be um, evaluated for hyposecretion purposes. These can be evaluated outpatient. So how do you manage these patients? So, um, you know, if patients have a microadenoma, then you do need to, um, so you do the initial uh, biochemical workup, but really there's no need to repeat the hypopit labs unless the cl clinical picture history of the MRI change. So once you get that initial workup, you don't necessarily need to repeat the biochemical workup. Again, unless there's changes. For macroadenomas, however, it's very different. So I normally repeat the workup about six months after the initial testing, and then yearly after that. And the reason is that there was a meta-analysis that showed the new endocrine dysfunction developed in 2.4% of patients per year. So that's why you want to repeat the workup. What about visual field testing? So you do this in all patients in whom the tumor abuts or compresses the optic chiasm. If it's a macroadenoma, but the tumor is nowhere near the optic chiasm, you don't need to do the visual field testing. So really the next main decision point, you know, you've established whether it's hypersecretory or whether it's hyposecretory. So the other main decision point, okay, do we operate or do we not operate? Like what's an indication for an urgent operation? So to, to get a better sense of this, we really have to consider, I would say three main things. The natural course, if you just let it be, um, non-operative options and then surgical options and subsequent outcomes. So if we're looking at the natural course, so this was a um, paper by Mark Molich, who's one of the gurus in, um, in pituitary. And he summarized the literature on the topic and we have microadenomas on the left, macroadenomas on the right. And the, the follow-up was about eight years for these studies on average. And as you can see, um, for microadenomas, only 10% of them really increase over time. Um, and the vast majority, 85%, do not increase in size. But what about macroadenomas? Almost a quarter of them got bigger, um, and only about 60% of them stayed the same, and then a minority decreased. So again, you're much more concerned about uh, macroadenomas enlarging than you are microadenomas. This was a study um, conducted in Italy in 2020, it was a retrospective study, and again, kind of looked at similar things. They enrolled 370 patients but only 200 had radiologic follow-up at about three years, for about three years. And we have the macroadenomas in blue and the microadenomas in orange. And as you can see, again, about 27% of macroadenomas grew, 
uh, compared to less than 10% in the microadenomas. Again, just highlighting um, that for macroadenomas, you're a lot more concerned about growth. And macroadenomas are any tumors that are above one centimeter. So one centimeter is a size cutoff for a macro versus a micro. Um, so what are the indications for surgery? If there's a visual field deficit due to the lesion or a visual abnormality due to compression, then you want to take them to surgery sooner rather than later. If there's pituitary apoplexy, meaning if the tumor bled into itself with visual disturbance, again, that's one of the few um, urgent surgical indications. And if it's hypersecretory, so if it's acromegaly or Cushing's, primary treatment is surgical um, as recommended per the, the guidelines. So back to our clinical case. So our patient had, um, we think was probably a non-functional adenoma um, with just a little bit of secondary hypothyroidism. Um, that had no contact with the optic chiasm on the initial MRI. Um, so you replace the deficiencies and then you discuss with the options with the patients. And really the options are you follow with serial MRIs or you refer to surgery. But really this is the kind of patient that you would probably refer to us in endocrinology or in the pituitary clinic. Um, there are two workup approaches. This is sort of a, per our endocrine society guidelines, but I'm, for interest of time, I'm going to move on to um, this approach. It's a little bit more specific, and this gives you a better sense of timing for these imaging. So again, if the tumor is hyperfunctioning, so if it's a prolactinoma, you treat it medically, otherwise Cushing's acromegaly surgically. If it's a microadenoma, so less than one centimeter, you repeat the MRI at one, two, then five years, and if there's no change, then then it's unclear what you do, but maybe you'll get some more. Again, this is more per debate, up, up for debate. If it's over one centimeter, then you need to do the visual field testing. Again, rule out hypo pituitary hypofunction. And again, you repeat the MRI at six months first, then one, two, and five years. Um, and then if there's tumor growth, then of course you consider um, surgery. This is an algorithm by Mark Molich. And so again, this is not technically for the guidelines. The guidelines are these. So the guidelines are more vague the official guidelines, and they say you essentially like monitor the labs and you monitor the MRIs. Realistically speaking, I think it is reasonable to refer these patients um, to us in clinic. So in summary, the prevalence of incidentally detected pituitary adenomas has increased. Um, biochemical evaluation for hypersecretion is essential. So again, you check that prolactin, you check the IGF-1 level, the Cushing's only if clinically indicated. Um, Hyposecretion evaluation is also essential. So you check your thyroid, you check the adrenals, you check the gonadal axes, but really the thyroid and the adrenal are the ones that are most important to replace um, in the immediate time frame, especially preoperatively. If there's concern for vision impingement based on the MRI, then you refer to surgery immediately. If there are no surg urgent surgical needs, then you follow with MRI. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. That was uh, that was a really fabulous overview um, of a lot of things. Um, I have a question in the chat, but before I ask that one, I'm going to quickly ask. Um, you know, you really outlined sort of how a primary care physician can approach this workup. But when do you guys like to see people referred? So I would say all macroadenomas certainly should be referred. Um, if there's any concern um, for a microadenoma being hyperfunctional, then I think a referral is very reasonable. And I see patients um, with microadenomas referred routinely. Um, I would say the more urgent referral is certainly for macros or for a tumor that's above one centimeter. Um, because again, these are the tumors that are more likely to grow um, and the tumors that uh, probably should be evaluated by um, neurosurgery. And Dr. Alter asks, with respect to prolactinomas, how often or have you ever seen a case of a high dose hook effect? Of oh, I'm sorry? Of a high dose hook effect, of the hook effect. Yeah, yes, all the um, pretty often, actually. Really? Um, yeah, but um, it never confounded the initial diagnosis because the initial prolactin was still very high. So it was still in the like three to 400 range. Then when I diluted it out, it was much higher. I think I had one patient that undiluted was maybe a thousand diluted was in the thousands. So it does happen. Uh, but again, I think that um, I use that to sort of help shape my, um, help direct my um, dopamine agonist management because I want to know what number I'm starting at. Um, thank, thank you. 
Dr. Alter, did you want to add? I see you. Just, just to say thank you, and um, I hope you don't mind that I referred to the high dose soak effect as the prozone, so so people could sort of trigger it from their memory of medical school and put I, it in context. Yeah, yeah. Great you know, talk, doctor. Great thing. talk. Yeah, this was terrific. And yes, the infectious disease doctor and me uh, appreciated the prozone reference too. Yeah. Um, well, fantastic. We are at the top of the hour, but um, that was really um, fantastic. And I love your final slide here as well. Oh yeah, the Mimosa flower, it's um, International Women's Day. I'm from Italy. And so we used to get these flowers in school on March 8th. So happy Women's Day. Oh, wow. Cool. Great. Great talk, Erica. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very, very much. We'll look forward to seeing everybody else next week. Thank you.